Hello and welcome to Cartoon Q&A. So in today's conversation, I chat with Maria Montenegro, who is a credentialed evaluator living and working in Vancouver, British Columbia. She is also the creator of The Evaluation Couch, a podcast discussing topics related to evaluation and navigating a career in evaluation. Among other things, we talk about discovering evaluation as a career, in the process of getting credentialed, Maria's work with Eval Youth, and the first real step to starting a podcast. It was a fun conversation that inspired a set of eight new comics, which you'll see appear throughout this video. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe and like this video. It means a lot. And after you're done watching, go ahead and check out the notes where you'll find a link where you can see and download full versions of all the comics I created. So how'd you end up in Canada? I came to Canada to study, to go to university for my undergrad. So I've been in Canada for 15 years. And what did you study? I went to school for environmental economics and policy. And then I did my master's straight from school in agricultural economics. And I had a focus on international development and specifically on women's environment. Uh, so very quantitative focus, uh, progressive methodology, and I do not identify myself as an economist, but it's been, it was helpful training for my evaluation practice. Nice. And how'd you find your way into evaluation? So I was, I used to work in a program for newcomers to Canada doing research, institutional research. And my supervisor at the time told me that we have to do an evaluation framework for the program. And I didn't know what evaluation was. I had never come across evaluation as a career option, even though a lot of people in my program actually had evaluation jobs from my cohort at one point or another, which I always find very interesting. But yeah, so she assigned this to me and I didn't know what evaluation was. So I took a course by the Canadian Evaluation Society called Essential Skills Program. And that was, it was an evaluation 101. It was in person. I think it was a couple of days. And yeah, that was it. That was enough for me to get recruited into the field. Yeah, and, and was it like once you were recruited into the field, did you find you enjoyed evaluation like right away or did it take a little bit of time? No, I even like during the course, I was like, okay, that like this is what I'm going to do. I think it because my master's was very research focused and I was doing research and I really enjoyed the doing research, but I didn't have good experiences in academia. And I was receiving pressure to do a PhD from my supervisors and I was considering it, but because I didn't have such a good experience in terms of like how academia works, the motivations that are in place for people to do things that don't necessarily align with my value, the amount of work that, for example, in my thesis, I put in, I was for three months in Peru collecting data from women about their empowerment and about the impact of land on their empower access to land on their empowerment and so many so much effort and so much data collected from people and then the the result was a very great thesis that received awards from two organizations and a publication that took many years in the making and then that was it. So I think I couldn't sit with that and also with a lot of other things that I saw happening in my master's program and with academics that I interacted with. So when I was in the essential skills course, it was, I just could see how with evaluation, I could continue doing research. I could continue having experiences like what I had in the field in Peru, working with people, understanding like kind of like you, like asking questions because I am a curious person and doing it in a way that is more likely to have a need and to be and have a reason for it. Yeah. So yeah, it, 
it was honestly like a recruitment. It was, I took the course and during the course, I was like, I'm going to become a credential evaluator. And that kind of, for me, that was a great way of saying, okay, I didn't learn evaluation in school. So I need to build the competencies and understand the methodologies and the approaches and the terms. So working through the credentialing process for me really helped. It was an outline of what I needed to do to get to a place where I could be a competent evaluator. Interesting. I, for people who don't know, can you talk a little bit about the credential evaluation evaluator process? We don't have it in the U.S. You have it in Canada, but there are a lot of countries across the world where evaluators fall into it and then they just learn on the job. But so talk to me a little bit about the process. So you said it was yeah. useful to get so, into it. Yeah. So the credential um, evaluation program is a program by the Canadian Evaluation Society where um, you have to meet a set of requirements. So I, I think one of them is two years of uh, work experience in evaluation. Uh, I think there's an education component. And then the valuable part, at least for me, in my journey was that you have to write a, a document describing how you meet all of the competencies in the Canadian Evaluation Society's competencies framework. And there is many competency frameworks. The Canadian Evaluation Society one's not the only one. They also overlap a lot. So in general, using any framework can be a good outline for, okay, what do I need to develop? And the, but I found that the process of having to write it and having to convince someone that you actually have that competency, that was valuable. And in the process of saying, okay, I'm going to apply for this. What are the competencies that I feel comfortable and confident writing about and which ones aren't? That is how I identified the areas that I needed to build and strengthen. So in that way, I found the process very helpful. And I, I do encourage people that are starting their career to go through that process, not necessarily the credential evaluate, the credential evaluator process. Um, because I don't think that is for everyone. I, um, but the process of thinking through the competencies and whether you can actually write that you have met them. Yeah, that's interesting. And so is there, is there a test at the end? Is there someone who is going through reading, reading what people are writing, checking it off and an interview yeah. process or is it? There's no interview process. You submit your application and then there's a review committee, but of experienced evaluators, they're all credentialed and they, I think there's two different reviewers that get to see your application and then they make a decision of whether you do meet the competence or not. And then you receive your credentialization. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I know with the American Evaluations Association, there's not it's not a credentialing process, but there are certain um, principles and, and guidelines and other pieces that I, I think uh, are worth looking at and at the very least and, and going through and seeing how, how evaluation gets defined and some of the different skill sets that you should have and or look into. Yeah, I can see how that would be useful. I think for people that are starting their career and the American Evaluation Association also has competencies. Um, and so do other organizations. There's also the competencies for industries like international development, for example. So regardless of what competency people use, I think that process of going through them is very helpful, especially if you didn't go through an education program where you already were exposed to evaluation as a profession and the skills that you need. That being said, though, I do want to acknowledge that credentialization and the professionalization of evaluation is a topic of debate and of tension within the evaluation community. And there are people that are not in agreement of these type of programs existing and others that are. And I think it really depends on people's specific needs and it is not for everyone. So. I do, I, I do want to highlight that because I think it's important when we're discussing this to make people aware that these debates exist. They definitely do exist. There are reasons beyond nobody thought about it. There's not really a credential evaluation 
kind of piece to the American Evaluation Association too. It is a constant debate. Hmm. Interesting. So you've been involved with Eval Youth. Can you talk a little bit about Eval Youth for people who don't know what that is? Yeah, Eval Youth is a global network um, of young and emerging evaluators that support the inclusion and the development of young people in evaluation. Um, so it's a global network of volunteers, and then there are regional chapters and there are some national chapters as well um, that have their own initiatives and their own events. They all kind of work in a different way, depending on the local needs of the place where they're operating. And then there's global programs. So I was involved with Evil Youth because I participated in the Evil Youth Global Mentorship Program, and it was a turning point in my evaluation career. Mm -hmm. And I became very passionate about Evil Youth from that experience. And then also realizing that I had done all of the steps that I was reading, I should do. I was involved with American Evaluation Association. I was involved with the Canadian Evaluation Society. I was following people on social media that speak about evaluation, but I had never heard of Eval Youth. And I started asking questions about why there was no presence of Eval Youth in North America. And then in those conversations and those discussions and connections I made through that, it led me to co founding Eval Youth North America, which is a uh, one of the new, I think, I believe the newest regional chapter of Eval Youth, and we're still new. I was the chair for two years, and I just stepped down in February. And now there's a very enthusiastic person, Olivia Melvin, who is taking on that role. And in addition to that, I also am finishing my term as the American Evaluation Association representative to Eval Youth. And yeah, that, that has been my involvement. It's been great to be involved in, in the organization and to support and increase awareness of those opportunities within our region, but also to collaborate and learn from other regions. Um, I have a lot of respect for the work that especially young people are doing in Latin America, in Asia. They have such a vibrant community. And yeah, it's been a great factor of my satisfaction and my identity as an evaluator. Nice. And so now you're podcasting now. And how long, how, when did you start podcasting? I could probably give you the exact date. I started podcasting. It was only like two months ago. Yeah. So very recent. And I saw you were on, but you've already put out 10 episodes. Um, yeah, so I do weekly episodes and then there's like an intro. So it's probably been a little bit over two, two months, but weekly episodes, I keep it flexible in terms of length and, and that kind of thing. But the podcast came from a lot of reflection and kind of professional development, personal development work that I've been doing this year in and the fact that I realized that when I was in university almost many years ago, like over 10 years ago, I was a career advisor. So I worked as a student in the career advising center of my university. And I did that for three years as a part-time job. And I learned so many skills. That was by far like the most useful job to have as a student. And I would help people with their resume, with their career um, development, with applying for jobs and practicing for interviews. And I realized that I never stopped doing that. So whenever I would have conversations with people, I meet a lot of people that are newcomers to Canada because I'm a, I am an immigrant. So I just end up connecting with people that way, but also through my different work experiences. And I would always end up having discussions and offering to review their resume and making them connections with them. and telling them how the, the, the labor market works here. And it was just, it's just always something that I've done naturally. And through my involvement in Eval Youth, I also have been very exposed to the challenges that young and emerging evaluators face. And even beyond young and emerging evaluators, right? People that fall into this profession and they don't know where to start. And all of this debate, 
and how exposed we are to very opinionated viewpoints on these things that can really shape the decisions that new people make and the insecurities that they have as well. So all of that led me to find a different way of doing that in a way that as I'm phasing out of my volunteer role in Eval Youth. So as I'm phasing out of Eval Youth, because I want to make spaces for young people, for them to bring their energy, but also for them to benefit from being included in a network like this, because Eval Youth provides so many opportunities to the people that are involved in it. So I, yeah, the, this podcast came up as a way to do that, as a way for me to continue talking about things that I'm very passionate about and things that I'm becoming more passionate about now as a manager, now that I, I have people reporting to me and I'm helping them navigate their careers and I'm doing certified coaching training because I, yeah, it's just like the way my life is going just keeps pushing me towards playing this role that I really enjoy. So that's what the podcast is. And it's been a great experience so far. What, what's it called? The yeah, podcast is called The Valuation Couch. The Valuation Couch. Mm-hmm. And I know it's... So did you... Are you creating it through the Spotify? Or are you creating it through some other way? Um, so it's available in multiple platforms. I use another software to record it and then I do, it's available on Spotify, on Apple. And then there's also like the one platform where I publish it that requires no subscription and it's called Blitzing. So usually when I post my episodes on social media, I have the free so that people have different options of how they want to connect and listen to it. Had you thought about doing a podcast for a while before doing a podcast or was it just like you were... You're like, you know what? I want to do a podcast. And then all of a sudden, you're, there you are. I actually, yeah, it's interesting. I actually had thought about doing a blog. And then as I was exploring the idea of doing a blog about a topic that went, had nothing to do with evaluation, it actually had to do with, and I love to travel. And when I travel, I'm seeing more and more these, these kind of push for the digital nomad. And people from the global north going into countries like Ecuador and benefiting from the amazing countries and cultures that we have and the more affordable cost of living and also creating a lot of of unintended consequences of them coming, uh, the great consequences of their increased tourism and all of that, but also some some unintended consequences. And in my trips and my travels, this idea kept coming up about raising awareness about this. Um, and I was thinking about creating a blog. Mm-hmm. And then I actually was on social media and I saw this social, this content creator talk about blogs and how blogs are not really that effective and impactful anymore and how podcasts are they have a huge opportunity and reach and more aligned with how people want to learn information and it made me reflect on what I do and I also not so much listen to podcasts but I listen to a lot of audiobooks and a lot of like webinars but the audio version so that that's how the idea came up well instead of writing a blog about that creating a podcast and then thinking more about what I'm really passionate about and what would be sustainable for me to talk about? And then it ended up landing in what the evaluation couch is today. Interesting. Yeah. How'd you learn how to do it? Like the process behind the process. Do you have any tips or people or guides? I, yeah, I think just the internet, to be honest, there's a lot of content available there so the i think the most important thing for me that would be the tip that i can actually offer is working first on the like the psychology behind it and your mindset one key aspect more important than the technology more important than the microphone and figuring out the platforms was 
identifying a topic that I actually was passionate about. The mindset of what this podcast is and where it fits in my life, because there's a lot of people that start these type of things as a project and then it doesn't last. They're not committed to it. And then the other aspect is being okay with not being perfect. I'm not a perfectionist in any way, but creating a podcast and putting yourself out there is, it's a lot. It is very vulnerable. And one thing that really helped me when I was starting to develop my podcast was to pick a few podcasts that I had been exposed to. And I listened to their first episode and their most recent episode. And it was so helpful to be like, it is okay. Like you are going to learn as you're doing it. And that applies to so many aspects of your career, like networking, interviewing, applying for jobs, even evaluation itself. When you do it the first time, it's not going to be perfect. But if you never do it, it's not ever going to be perfect. So that importance of taking action and that was very key for me. And another thing that in terms of tips, and I know that people are very different in how they approach this. I actually talk about this in one of my upcoming episodes, but is identifying what barriers you're going to face. That self-awareness piece of knowing yourself. And for me, when I was working on the podcast, I knew through that process of understanding myself that sometimes when I've shared these type of ideas in the past, I get discouraged from some of the comments that people close to me made that are very well intended, um, but things like, how do you know people haven't done this before? Or how do you know people are going to hear this? Uh, like actually be interested in this. And so I made the decision of not sharing with absolutely anyone that I've worked with, um, not even my partner. <laughs> I shared with my partner when I had like everything, what you see online, when I had my little photo and the title and the draft of the first uh, episode, but they almost no one knew that this was coming out until I actually published it. And that, that was very helpful for me. That's, it's definitely a good strategy. I, I think there are a number of people who are pretty popular now who have pretty good size followings who definitely started that way they like started very much just being okay with being like a little obscure they're like okay we're just going to give this some time we're going to create and create and then eventually people will will share it and it's interesting um, it's interesting that's how you went to yeah it's this whole idea of you can't expect to have like listeners and a follower you can't expect to have clients if you're not offering anything, right? Mm-hmm. Even in evaluation consulting, for example, how are people going to find you if you're not actually offering a service and being out there? So being okay with that was it an interesting process that definitely required work. But I think without doing that work, I wouldn't have ever launched the book. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I've started listening to it. I haven't made it that far, but I'm looking forward to diving in a little bit too. Who makes a good evaluator? Who who should think about evaluation or as a career path? That's part of it, right? Like your podcast is, is about, it's about evaluation, but it's also about the evaluation as a career and navigating it as a career. So I'm just curious, have you found, like who should really consider going into evaluation? I think everyone in some way or another is an evaluator. And I think there's no personality type. I don't think there's any like specific requirement. I think you can cultivate all of the skills and competencies and traits that make people a good evaluator. And I also think there's so much diversity within the evaluation field and options in evaluation careers that you can really shape it into something that fits very nicely in your strength. Like for example, you um, and the way that you bring this uniqueness to the evaluation field. Or in me, that now I'm focusing on careers in evaluation. And there there's so many opportunities for that to be in place. So 
I think in general, some of the things that perhaps are harder to build are a, a sense of curiosity. I, I definitely think having a sense of curiosity is important in our work and, and a passion for, for improving our world. <laughs>